And we are back on the Zero Hour with Mark Ames, one of our regular contributors and a great writer for the Pando Daily, who's also written a piece on the on Ukraine, and I think his voice needs to be heard on this market. He, before he went to Pando Daily, he was one of the founders of NSFW Corp., as in Not Safe for Work. Many know him best as the founding editor of the satirical Moscow bi-weekly The Exile, which was a lot of great writing in there. He is the author of Going Postal Rage, Murder, and Rebellion from Reagan's Workplaces to Clinton's Columbine and co-author of The Exile, Sex, Drugs, and Libel. <laughs> I love that title in a new Russia. Uh, he's been a regular contributor to The Nation to MSNBC's Dylan Radigan show, and he's with us now. Mark, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Good to be here. You bet. Now, you wrote a great piece on Ukraine with, by the way, a great title, which is, um, which is, I'm trying to find it now because my window just closed on me. It was <laughs> called, Sorry America, Isn't Ukraine Isn't All About You, which is a, a shocking thing. One of the things you say in it is that um, the sort of liberal, yuppie pushback has faded away. Putin is powerful and popular there. He's kind of taking a Nixonian strategy to all of this, and um, and we we ought to not make the conflict in Ukraine about ourselves. I think you basically said, um, you know, the silent majority cheered on Nixon while college students were gone down on campuses. Eighty percent of Americans sided with Lieutenant William Kelly, who massacred civilians of Mille. Sorry, Ukraine, but you're screwed. This is barely about you. It's about us. It, it always is. That's how you concluded. Uh, but enough about me. What do you think of me? Um, yeah, well, I, what I tried to do with the story is um, watching the way everybody's been really framing um, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, and in particular Putin and his actions. They've been framing it you know, pretty much through our own lens, which is uh, you know, either he's a, a neo-Stalinist or neo-imperialist, and he's, he's reviving you know, these chessboard ambitions, uh, and it's all about us, or because we're such a aggressive, expansionist, evil empire, he's, he's taking defensive actions that are rational and natural, and he's therefore a bulwark against American imperialism. And, and you know, as I said, I mean, there's some truth to both of those, but as we know here, um, uh, all politics is local, and nobody's really talked about what, uh, you know, put Putin's actions into, um, into perspective in, in terms of what's going on locally. What's, what's he doing in Ukraine and, and elsewhere um, that, that is shoring up or, you know, a reflection of his own political problems within Russia? And that's when I get into a bit of, uh, of, the, of the history of Putin's politics in Russia. And, and that history, I mean, I'll try and sum it up quickly, is sort of this. Um, you know, he first came to power in 1999 after the disastrous Yeltsin years. Um, he was very popular when he first came to power, and he was supported by the liberals and even members of the intelligentsia, surprisingly enough, the, the dissident intelligentsia. I think they liked him at first, despite the brutality of the, of the Chechen War, the Second Chechen War, they liked him because um, uh, the, the Yeltsin years were a nightmare. They truly were. I mean, they brought in these shock therapy, free market reforms that tanked the economy. Uh, people started dying off in, you know, grotesque numbers in Russia in the 1990s. And Putin seemed, he wasn't drunk, for one thing, and he was articulate, and, uh, and he seemed like he might turn things around. And so people, the liberals and the free market liberals in particular sort of thought, oh, he'll be maybe a good Pinochet. Well, over time, he turned out to be not a good Pinochet, as no Pinochet ever is. He started alienating the liberals um, uh, up through when he left office, uh, the Kremlin the first time in 2008. And then he handpicked this guy, Dmitry Medvedev, to be his successor uh, in the Kremlin in 2008. And at that point, you know, under Putin, a whole new middle class, a yuppie class, had really built up, um, uh, particularly in Moscow and a couple of other big cities. The country got a lot wealthier. Uh, certainly the middle class built up. But everybody else in Russia's 11 time zones were pretty much completely left behind. So you have now inequality in Russia, the worst in the world um, by, by most measures that I've seen. Um, and it's really shocking and appalling. So you go from the most equitable 
you know, socialist country in the world to the worst inequality in the world. And what you have is, what I wrote about, is you have a, a giant base, a, you know, I compare it to the Nixon era, the silent majority, that has never been paid attention to, that has seen all these, you know, cultural uh, changes as well as, really traumatic economic changes go on in the last 20 years. Well, what happens? Putin in 2011 um, decides he wants to just come right back to power. And he did it very crudely. In late 2011, he just said, okay, puppet who I put in the Kremlin, you're moving back to the prime minister's office. I'm moving back to the Kremlin. I don't like this situation. And when he did that, he really, you know, the yuppies, the middle class were very big, very important in a top-down culture like Russia, they revolted hugely. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I didn't expect it. Nobody expected it. I really doubt Putin expected it. You know, when they had the rigged elections a couple months later, in December of 2011, I mean, something like 100,000 young middle-class Russians took to the streets, faced down riot cops, which is a scary thing in any country and really scary there. And, um... And so I, it was clear to Putin at that point, he lost uh, the middle class. And that's a, that's a dangerous, in Russia, uh, you know, and anywhere, it's a, but certainly in Russia, it's a dangerous class to lose. He lost them for good. And so he's been, ever since then, gearing his politics towards, you know, what I call the silent majority or red state Russians or whatever. All these people who've been, you know, really screwed over and left behind in the free market reforms and who've been ignored even in culturally and so on. So you've seen Putin viciously targeting gays. That's playing mm -hmm. in a Nixonian way towards the silent majority. And then it forces the liberals and, and the middle class, the yuppies, to, to then identify with gays, which then, you know, uh, pushes them further away from the masses. Um, mm. he's Interesting. Targeting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, and targeting Pussy Riot did the same thing. Pussy right. Riot's extremely unpopular, and he was able to conflate his opposition, which was very big and broad, with Pussy Riot. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and meanwhile, he's been absolutely, you know, creating a, a real totalitarian state, shutting down Internet freedom, shutting down whatever was really left of the free press and, and free political parties and so on. And um, and so that's all the background to when you get to February, when there's this U.S.-backed, pro-Western, anti-Russian, very anti-Russian revolution in Kiev. And, and that's how I wanted to explain, like, rather than looking at Putin as, uh, uh, and this, this isn't certainly any more comfort, <laughs> but rather than looking at Putin as whether he's an imperialist or, you know, what, as if we're on his mind all the time. He's actually, what it's on his mind is his domestic power, as any, mm -hmm. and, and that means, and you can see his, the way he has been acting in Ukraine, taking Crimea, just taking it. Um, you know, it's very different from the way he, from, from the way he acted in previous crises, uh, let's say from 2000 to 2008. He was a lot more, Reserved, I would say, and he had one eye definitely on the West in a much bigger way. Now he's sort of he's he's doing the sorts of things that uh, that the silent majority of the red state Russians would like to see done. Um, they're sick and tired of um, having been pushed around by the West, having been humiliated, having liberals tell them what should be done, having you know every country around them hating them, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, and so he's, he's he's much more aggressive this time around, and not as concerned with sort of Western dominated international norms. Let's say um, they're doing well, then, it their way now. Well, then in the situation you described, Mark uh, Mark Ames, it sounds like what we're doing diplomatically and some of the other posturing we've done rhetorically. Uh, not to mention, you know, whether it's military exercises in Poland or whatever, it sounds like we're probably making the situation even worse or, or provoking more of a spirit of confrontation. Is that something, is that right? I, I absolutely think so. And, you know, I, I would say let's reapply that back to ourselves as well. I'd say part of that is has to do with our own domestic politics. Um, you know, uh, 
one guy doesn't want to look weak uh, to Putin because of, you know, the next elections and the way the other guy might use that. I mean, how much of what we're doing is driven purely by the science of diplomacy and global, you know, global diplomacy, and how much of it is driven by our own domestic political considerations? Um, you know, well, one uh, of the things, one of the things yeah. that, that that I've mentioned before that just uh, cracks me up in a sick way, I suppose, about about this whole situation is how Russian uh, Republicans, for example, will talk about how vile and aggressive and hostile Putin is, and then they'll complain about Obama for not being more like him. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're very confused. They, um, they, you know, I, but, but there is another part of this which is more serious and depressing, which is, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what we were doing, what we were thinking, sort of helping, helping light the fire and helping push Ukraine to a crisis point when they could have just waited for the next elections. Yanukovych was very unpopular. Um, and we did play a pretty serious role in, in the events in Kiev and, and, and the Maidan revolution there in February. Um, but, but look, the people, you know, the, the diplomat overseeing it, it's uh, Victoria Newland. She's, I think it's Robert Kagan's wife. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're, they're just the neocons um, have jumped all over this. And they, from a neocon's point of view, um, creating a crisis, um, uh, you know, a tense potential war crisis. That's ex that's their red meat. That's that's what they think pushes their agenda to the forefront and empowers them. So from their point well, of view, this is all great. And and they're probably right about that, which is a yeah. which is the most de depressing part of it at all. Well, I assume you'll keep writing about this and you'll keep us uh, informed as you go. And I hope you'll come back and talk to us about it again. I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Mark Ames, writer for Pando Daily and former uh, co-editor of The Exile, uh, based in Russia. He knows the area. And look, we've got, uh, we've got uh, a society of disaffected, angry people who are being, uh, whose emotions are being stoked in tough economic times by talk of war. I'm speaking, of course, about the Tea Party and the neocons. Uh, and the strange relationship between them. And then on the other side of the fence, we have Putin, a very interesting analysis of, of why Putin is posturing as a strong man. Long story short, if we don't start treating the Ukraine situation uh, rationally with our uh, heads instead of our hearts, the people who are going to suffer most are the Ukrainians and uh, we'll be uh, right there behind them at least economically and politically. So that's it for our today's Ukraine coverage. When we come back, we'll be talking about the movie Citizen Coke, and we'll be talking about net neutrality. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero.